Chapter 5 Other Roads to Religion This chapter includes interesting biographies of six individuals whose lives and teachings have greatly affected world religions. Among the most popular religions are those named after Buddha, Confucius, and Muhammad. Martin Luther is noted for his work in the Protestant Reformation. The ideologies of Marx and Lenin are included briefly because they have engulfed half the world and are threatening the other half. Though these two men do not claim to be religionists themselves, they have formed a set of beliefs which overlap into the field of religious thought. Certainly their destruction of other religions is reason enough to understand why and how they think and believe. Buddha, Prince of Peace and Tranquility Siddhartha Gautama, later called Buddha, was born in 563 BC at Nepal in the northern part of India. He was the son of the Sakya clan of royalty, so he had, for the most part, all the things that a young boy could want. At the age of 19, Gautama chose to marry his beautiful cousin, and they settled down to enjoy life in a dream world of their own. But for the next ten years, they had no children, which was a dark cloud in the life of this young handsome prince. He was disappointed that God denied him the blessings of such an important part of his life. One day as he was riding through the countryside with the driver of his chariot, they passed an old man, withered up with age, dissipated in strength, and growing, more feeble with each passing day. Such is life, commented the charioteer. We must all come to this end. Later, they saw a beggar by the road whose body was being eaten away with some loathsome disease. This, too, is part of life, commented the driver. This was a new form of education for Gautama, for now he had seen poverty, old age and death, areas he had never seriously contemplated before. Gautama had been raised in the riches of the palace and sheltered from such sights, so this made an indelible impression upon him, never to be forgotten. Gautama was touched to the soul, by the miseries, cruelties and regrettable end that man must endure in this life. He was disappointed that God would allow such suffering in a world so beautiful. Many ancient prophets bewailed the cruelty of man, but Buddha complained of the cruelty of God. His soul was torn and sorrowful, and he wanted an explanation to these imposing problems. He even questioned if life was worth living at all. Gautama's father had a big banquet for his son to celebrate his birthday and to announce the birth of Gautama's first child. Yet in spite of the joy of the occasion, God area was still burdened with the problem of the miseries of life. Early one morning, he arose with his mind made up that he would leave the palace, his wife and new son and seek for the answers to his questions about life. He would become a wandering nomad, a priest, or an ascetic, just so he could find out what man was and why he was faced with such sorrow and misery. For the last time, Gautama looked upon his sleeping wife and child, awoke his charioteer, and quietly left the palace. At the young age of 29, he began a pilgrimage that would light the fires of faith that still glow after 2500 years. But his venture in faith was not an easy one. For a considerable time he studied under the yoga masters, but he found no spirituality with them. Then he sought answers through mortification of the flesh, fasting until he nearly died, but still no answers. As a hermit in asceticism, he descended from the mountains with a bowl in hand to beg for his food. Through all his fasting, poverty, sacrifice, and grief, he was reduced to little more than a skeleton. Though he was close to death, he was still far from the truth he sought. After six years of searching, Gautama left the holy men, the discomforts of the flesh, and all the sacrifices, and in despair took some food and sat beneath a bow tree one evening. That night, he had a vision in which he saw the evil tempter of the world and was confronted by this prince of darkness. The tempter offered him the riches of the world if he would serve him, but the young prince called upon the earth beneath him to witness that he would not move from the course of his conscience. Finally, the tempter left, and from whatever else he saw, Gautama received the answer to his great quest. He was now Buddha, the enlightened one. With the coming of dawn and the light of day, so did Buddha become enlightened with an understanding of the riddle of life and the destiny of mankind. He arose and traveled to the city of Banaras, where he found five of the holy men that had once been his traveling companions. Buddha began to decry the foolishness of the priests and their superstitious and foolish doctrines. 
For the next 45 years, he became a traveling preacher to help enlighten others. His efforts have shown results in China, India, Japan and other nations, with over 180 million followers and half the world well aware of his life and teachings. He taught that the soul must become subdued and subjected to doing right and live a good life until it finally reaches nirvana, a state of perfect calmness or purity reached in its entirety only after death, but, partially achieved in life by those who are absolutely consecrated and withdrawn from the world. It was an exaltation which was more desirable than life itself. Buddha said that each man creates for himself his own prison, so also he may acquire power equal to that of the gods. Many people are critical of Buddhism because it is not really a religion with ritualistic and spiritual form of worship. It is, in effect, a way of life, a lifestyle dedicated to a future life with established principles and teachings. This is really not too different from many religions. He promoted an eightfold path that would end the sorrow of birth, age, and death in the world. 1. Right knowledge. 2. Right intentions. 3. Right speech. 4. Right conduct. 5. Right means of livelihood. 6. Right efforts. 7. Right mindfulness. 8. Right concentration. Buddha also set down ten precepts requited of all aspirants to the Buddhist ranks. They were to abstain from 1. Taking life. 2. Taking what is not given. 3. Unchastity. 4. False speaking. 5. Using intoxicating liquors. 6. Eating at forbidden times. 7. Worldly amusements. 8. Using perfumes and ornaments. 9. Using a high or broad bed. 10. Accepting gold or silver. He said the only way that man could free himself from worldly cravings and physical desires was to discipline the mind against self-indulgence, power, conquest, and lust. Self-control is man's most important objective. He taught that heroism means to suffer without inflicting pain to others, to be patient and tolerant of others, and to have courage in death. Buddha defined the commandment of not killing humans or any other living thing, since we cannot create life, we have no right to destroy it. Let a man overcome anger by love, let him overcome evil by good, let him overcome the greedy by liberality, the liar by truth, he taught. Shame on him that strikes, greater shame on him who, stricken, strikes back, he said. Since, for each one of us, our own self is the most important, respect the self of your fellow man as you respect your own. Great Religions, National Geographic Society, page 97. One of the cornerstones of his beliefs was the principle of moderation in all things, and that only the individual himself can walk the path to inner understanding and the ultimate truth. The Buddhist doctrine relies little upon outward miracles or manifestations of the supernatural. Its basic principles are towards being gentle and peaceable. The Buddhists are among the most tolerant and peaceful people on the earth, for they have never shed blood in a holy crusade, nor persecuted anyone for not believing in Buddhism. This is the marked difference between the history of Mohammedans and the Christians. When Buddha was 80 years old, he ate dinner with a blacksmith, but the food was tainted and Buddha became sick and died. His last words were for his followers to work out your own salvation with diligence. It is said that men wept, the skies darkened, and the earth trembled. To the Hinayana Buddhists, he is not worshipped as either a man or a god, but as the embodiment of a principle of enlightenment. The thousands of images and statues of Buddha in temples throughout Asia are not realistic portraits of an individual, but idealized symbols of those teachings and codes of life. They believe Gautama was not the only Buddha, for others appeared from time to time. Religions are born, they grow, and they change, none is exempt. So it was with Buddhism. It is split into three major factions, with other minor branches. In India, during the years to follow, the monasteries grew wealthy. They owned great portions of land and had slaves, and they paid but little attention to the laymen. Then in the 12th century, Muslim invaders sacked the monasteries, and the laity had little incentive to go back to their faith. Buddhism almost disappeared from the very place of its birth. 
Some of the teachings of Buddhism today may have originated in Brahmanism and later became incorporated into the teachings of Buddhism. They taught that every human soul may go through many migrations in this world on its way to heaven, and only after one has achieved a life enlightened enough through the proper teaching and living, can he attain to that heaven. But whatever Buddhism was originally, today its teachings have become somewhat confusing and hard to understand. Certainly the original teachings of life were much better understood by Buddha himself. The mysterious goal of nirvana is, however, still held out to those who embrace this faith. Confucius, Sage of the Orient Confucius, or Kung Fu Tzu, meaning the sage or master, was born in 551 BC in the province of Lu. His father, Xu Liang He was a soldier with a large family of two wives and over a dozen children. Confucius was the twelfth child of the first wife, but when he was three years old, his father died. Kung Fu was a lad of excellent health and enjoyed games and entertainments with physical skill, however, he also enjoyed poetry and music. He acquired knowledge so fast that at the age of fifteen, his masters told him they had nothing more for him to learn. Two years later, he had to give up his studies to care for his aged mother, who was failing in her health. At the age of 19 Confucius married and a year later he had a son, but his marriage was a failure. It is not clear why this marriage did not continue. At the time he was 24 years old, his mother died, and according to the custom of the Chinese, he was in mourning for two and a half years. By now he had adopted a firm philosophy of life and was enjoying the society of friends in whom he could instill some of his sage counsel. Others encouraged him to continue his teachings for the benefit of others, so he became a wandering teacher. He would travel along the rice fields, in the marketplaces, and at any place at any time to offer his wisdom. He would be offered food and a place to stay with those who benefited from his newly developed philosophy of life. He wanted to teach his fellow men to be the most noble and honorable men of the world. However, he could see that in order to provide the proper surroundings for his teachings within his nation, he must first secure for them a just government which would tolerate, if not encourage, such teachings. At one point in his quest, he nearly obtained the success he sought. The ruler of Qi, one of the more unstable provinces at that time, was ready to offer him an important position in his court, but a jealous minister convinced the king that it should not be done. Thus, Confucius had to leave in a hurry and continued his teachings elsewhere. Finally success began to unfold as the emperor of the province of Lu appointed Kung Fu as mayor of one of the cities. Later, he gained more influence by being appointed minister of justice over the entire state. Kung Fu's district was troubled by petty thieves, but he considered it more important to correct the cause of crime rather than to punish the criminal. He suggested that people stop their greed so that negative influence would not inflict society, neither would they have so much for others to steal. Confucius also urged his emperor to strive diligently for peace in his administration, and then to try to become as a father to a son by seeing that his subjects had the opportunity for sufficient food and adequate education. With such wise advice, he gained popularity and respect, and the influence of his teaching spread throughout the entire kingdom of Lu. He was on the road to making his entire nation one of the most civilized, peaceful, and powerful anywhere. Confucius's dream of a super-society and superior men was close to being a reality until the jealousy and fears of those in other provinces started to undermine his work. The ruler of the province of Qi, envious of the king of Lu and the leadership of Confucius, decided on a plan to overthrow both. He sent eighty beautiful dancing girls to seduce the king and his cabinet into a different kind of philosophy. The girls did their job very well and the plan was a success. The government officers were more interested in the dancing girls than they were in Confucius. Confucius was both disgusted and demoted. The emperor rejected him and his words, so once again, Confucius, began the road circuit with his teachings. Often he met with opposition and on more than one occasion he was attacked by robbers in the road. But he did not give up. He wandered over China for thirteen years. Confucius compiled five books, setting forth rules for private and public conduct, especially kindliness, integrity, politeness, truthfulness, and sagacity. 
He also emphasized the importance of obedience of children to their parents and the veneration of their ancestors. His position regarding religion was best expressed in his saying, respect the gods, but have as little as possible to do with them. He maintained that if men would deal rationally with each other, then they would be qualified to speak of the things of God. He declared that if his nation could be governed justly for a single century, then all violence and poverty would disappear. Accordingly, he set up a code of ethics for men in government for their self-discipline. He raised the status of the peasant to respectability and yet did not detract from the honor of men in political positions. Be loyal to yourselves, and charitable to your neighbors, was a theme upon which he based his views of men in all climes of life. When his followers asked him to define his entire code of ethics in a single word, he replied, Is not reciprocity the word? When they asked him to explain the word, he replied, Reciprocity means just this, what you would not have done to yourself, do not to others. The last days of Confucius were sad ones for him. He received news that his wife, whom he still loved even though they were divorced, had died. Then came word that his only son had also died. Many of his closest disciples had passed from this mortal world, as well. Confucius himself passed away at the age of 72, and he was buried at Qufao, where pilgrimages are made. It appeared that his life had been a failure. Only a few had taken his words to heart, and like the early Christians, they were persecuted for their radical doctrines. Two hundred years after his death, one of the Chinese emperors made an attempt to burn every copy of his books then in existence. A number of zealous scholars concealed their books and were buried alive for their disobedience to the king. Today the books of Confucius are as popular in China as the Bible is in the West. Childhood of the Human Race, Henry Thomas, page 38 Every city in China had a temple in honor of Confucius. For many years it was popular to quote Confucius say, and give a little idiom with a special message of hope, guidance or wisdom, such as. Let the sole worry of your parents be that you might become ill. Shall I tell you what knowledge is? It is to know both what one knows and what one does not know. Great man is no robot. Great man develops the virtues in others, not their vices. Petty man does just the opposite. Great man is completely at ease, petty man is always on edge. Great man seeks to be slow of speech, but quick of action. Great man does not accept a man for his words alone, he does not reject a suggestion because of the man alone. If a man does not give thought to problems which are still distant, he will be worried by them when they come nearer. Do not worry about not holding high position, worry rather about playing your proper role. Worry not that no one knows of you, seek to be worth knowing. Excellence does not remain alone, it is sure to attract neighbors. The end has indeed arrived. I have yet to meet a man as fond of excellence as he is of outward appearances. Taken from the Sayings of Confucius, by James R. Ware. Muhammad, Prophet of Peace and the Sword. Shortly after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Arabs rose to fame. From numerous Bedouin tribes who wandered over the desert, they were transformed into powerful armies that conquered, captured, and destroyed vast territories. In a century and a half, they plundered through the Eastern Hemisphere, from India to Spain, and from Egypt to China. This success was because of the combination of a god called Allah, a religion called Islam, and a prophet called Muhammad, meaning, he who will be praised. Muhammad was an illiterate camel driver born in Mecca in 570 AD losing his father shortly after he was born, and then his mother when he was six, his early years were troubled and tossed by adversity. For a couple of years he lived with his grandfather, who also died, and then was raised by an uncle, Abu Talib. Muhammad was raised around a people who worshipped wooden dolls, a black meteorite stone by the well called Zemzem, and other tangible idols. He even saw humans, usually baby girls, being sacrificed to these gods. At the age of 14, he made a trip to Syria with some relatives on a trading venture. Here, for the first time, he saw Christians and Jews. After this confrontation, he began to ponder the faith and practices of other world religions. Muhammad was a nervous boy and had dizzy spells which seemingly caused him to see strange things. 
At 18 years of age, he joined the army during the time when the Arabians were often fighting each other. It was in some of these battles that he distinguished himself as a diligent and courageous fighter. Muhammad found that the army was not an appealing way to make a living, so once again he turned to the trading market. He became a salesman for a widow named Khadija. She was deeply religious and also rich. In spite of the difference in age, he was only 25 and she was in her 40s, she fell in love with Muhammad and they were married. Once a year, Muhammad would leave his wife and friends for a month to retire into a cave for contemplation and to seek the answer to a question which bothered him continually, who am I, and what should he do about it? He wanted to know his destiny. But every year he returned from the cave with the question unanswered. When Muhammad was 40, he made his annual pilgrimage to the cave with his question of personal identity. This time he received an answer. We are not sure what happened, but he claimed the angel Gabriel appeared to him with some good news. When he came out of the cave, he knew that wooden dolls were not gods to be worshipped. However, his revelation was not well received among the people, especially by the owners of those cute little dollies, who said his revelation was pure blasphemy. Muhammad was considered mad, and he was ridiculed and occasionally someone even tossed rocks at him. It is important to learn the original ideology of Muhammad and the nature of the man when he received his first revelation. From Henry Thomas, we quote, It was the religion of Islam, the joy of submitting to the will and the wisdom of Allah, since his will is the ocean in which our human desires are but drops of water, and his wisdom is the sun which puts to shame the murky flickerings of our mortal thoughts. Let us glory in the sun's light and warmth and power to give life and beauty to the earth, but let us not dare to look into its face, lest in our folly we go blind. Let us cheerfully, and without question, accept our destiny, whatever it may be, for it is a necessary thread in the weaving of Allah's plan. Allah knows best, and he who worships Allah and loves his fellow men lives best. The Parade of the Sword and the Cross, page 61 Muhammad himself was an ardent lover of his fellow men. His habits were simple. He lived on barley bread and water, and, in spite of his wealth, he waited on himself. He refused to physically strike or even to criticize anyone. When he was asked on a certain occasion why he did not curse his enemies, he replied, I have not been sent to curse, but to be a mercy to mankind. He reproached himself for having been unkind to a beggar who had asked for alms. He preached the gospel of Allah, the compassionate, and as yet, had nothing to say about Allah, the revengeful. Religion was to come quietly into the human heart, it was not to be ushered in with a sword. Use no violence in religion, he warned his early followers, a warning, however, that he emphatically retracted later on. After three years of preaching his new gospel, Muhammad had acquired only thirteen disciples. They were persecuted, ridiculed, and driven out of town. He was told they would kill him, as they did some of his disciples, if he didn't quit spreading discontent among the wooden idol worshippers. In 622 AD Muhammad escaped from the hands of his brothers in Mecca, this became known as Hajira, or the Great Flight. It was also the beginning of the Muhammadism that we know today. About this time his wife died and most of his family turned against him. He also learned that a hatchet brigade had been formed from among the Bedouins, one out of each tribe, and they had taken an oath as hit men to get Muhammad. So Muhammad traveled over desert and mountains to escape to Medina, a little city of 15,000 people. Here he found a mixture of many different religions, and he felt safe. But he never forgot the treatment he had received, nor the wanted poster for his death. While he preached love and kindness, he was shunned and lacked followers but now his attitude changed and he decided to fight fire with fire. No longer was he a prophet of peace, but spread his message with a sword. Muhammad's first mission for Allah was to raid caravans near Mecca. Several battles followed, which he won. About 900 Jews were caught and robbed. They didn't believe his story about Allah, so he sent them to be with their ancestors. His sword was bathed in heaven. His bloody, holy mission was gaining attention, if not converts. Each of his disciples killed in these wars was promised an immediate ticket to heaven, a heaven that was filled with beautiful girls who would embrace them for their great sacrifice on earth. 
All this was written in the Quran, the new Bible of the Mohammedans. This book was dictated in parts and pieces, and then finally put together without making any sense of continuity. Yet it was considered important enough that Muhammad and his devotees demanded, choose between the Quran and death. It contained only a few of the original ideologies of his early doctrine, the rest is the Bible of blood. Muhammad should not be held responsible for all that the Quran contains, as there is abundant evidence that it has been changed and corrupted in many places since his death. The Hand of Providence, Elder J. H. Ward, 1883, page 23. Arabia, that barren but rich land, is over ten times the size of the state of Utah, but the thinking of its people today remains much as it was under Muhammad. There is one God, and Muhammad is his prophet. His followers have adopted the code of civil and religious unity under the banner of warriors. Little change has ever been made in that philosophy. Until the latter part of his life, Muhammad's philosophy was to allow every believer equal privileges. He believed in Allah, and most of his revelations began with in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. However, Muhammad didn't show much respect for equal rights and mercy during the last ten years of his life, which were spent in plundering, killing, and living a life of violence. Such was the sunset in the life of Muhammad, who originally preached peace, love, and kindness to his fellow men. He died at the age of 62, having apostatized from the religion of his own making. Martin Luther, the pious monk who rocked Rome. Martin Luther was born in 1483 into a German household of poverty, and it was fortunate that he could sing or he might have starved. On the way home from school, he would sing from door to door for something to eat. His father was a strict disciplinarian and so it was in his schooling, too. Luther once commented, I was flogged fifteen times in one forenoon over the conjugation of a verb. Great Voices of the Reformation, Fosdick, page 71. Luther was an excellent student and strict in his morals. His display of intellectual excellence brought him to the Erfurt University when he was eighteen years old. It was here that he ran on to a Bible for the first time in his life. Oh, that God would give me such a book, he exclaimed. As he read from those pages, his whole life changed. More than anything else in the world, he wanted to be a scriptorian, but the only way to do that was to become a monk. So he entered the monastery and was assigned to the dirtiest chores of the cloister. He was told that to beg for food, carry out garbage, and suffer was the way to find God. He never found God amidst the garbage, but he never quit trying, nor did he shrink from any sacrifice in his search. At one point, Luther was saved from death by his fellow monks when they found him starving and unconscious. I was indeed a pious monk, and followed the rules of my order more strictly than I can express. If ever a monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works, I should certainly have been entitled to it. If I had continued much longer, I should have carried my mortification even to death. Diabine's History of the Reformation, Book 2, Chapter 3 among Luther's early experiences was a pilgrimage to Rome. Who could be a worthy monk without roaming to Rome? He thought it would bring absolution of sins, but instead he found sin, not in himself, but in Rome. He stated that there are more devils in Rome than tiles on the rooftops. Yet it was the home of the Mother Church, and he couldn't renounce it just because of the presence of evil. He was in for another surprise. As he was ascending the steps of Pilate's staircase on his knees, which was supposed to bring a remission of sins, he heard a voice repeat the scripture, The just shall live by faith, Romans 1 verse 17. He then wondered what he was doing by such a ridiculous performance, and he got up and walked away with a new understanding of religion. Superstitious works of ceremonies, rituals, and pilgrimages do not absolve sin, nor do they make a person more worthy in the sight of God. It is faith in God that justifies the character in men. On the way to Rome, Martin had visited other monasteries along the way. He was appalled at the corruption of the monks and the priests. When he got to Rome, he thought it would be better. Holy Rome, I salute you. Then he met the monks, priests, and officials of the church. He was grieved in his soul to see the lavish luxuries of the priests, the splendid living quarters where they dined on expensive food. 
Rome outdid the pagans. Luther returned to Wittenberg a changed man, he had a different faith and a different outlook on the church. Holy Rome was unholy, and sacred rituals and relics became silly sacraments. But the church was still the church. Luther was ordained a priest and then a doctor of divinity at the university. Then entered Tetzel. This man was selling indulgences. An indulgence was an official commendation from the Pope to forgive men's sins, not only those of the past and the present, but also those that a man might want to commit in the future, and not even repentance is necessary. Peter once told a man, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Acts 8 verse 20. But times change. It was now 1510 and Pope Julius II needed money for rebuilding the Church of St. Peter in Rome. Getting the money was a serious problem. Normal business schemes would be too slow, the margin on luck was too narrow, and getting riches from the poor would be worse. A brilliant scheme called selling indulgences would prove to be a bestseller. An indulgence was a promissory note, drawn on the first bank of heaven, to pardon the sins of those who paid money to the church. The idea went over like a gold strike on the Klondike, a jackpot in Nevada, and a bull market on Wall Street, all wrapped up in one bundle. The poor sacrificed nearly all they had, and the rich were more than generous. It was a miracle, money flowed like a river into Rome. If the early Caesars would have thought of this, they could have avoided all the wars. Luther looked upon all this and wondered if it were the Lord or the devil that was gaining all the souls. After some serious thinking, on October 31, 1517, Luther posted a scriptural argument against the indulgences in the form of 95 theses. It was merely a thought-provoking statement, which he asked the local parishioners to use as a basis for debate. No argument ensued. Just when Luther thought it was of no concern to anyone, all hell broke loose. Someone gave a copy to a local printer who published it. From there it went to Belgium, France, Holland, England and a few other countries, and the storm never ceased from then on. The mercenary ministers of Rome were offended, so Luther was denounced as a heretic. Luther was 34 at the time and was going to age much faster. He thought that it would be better if the Pope, who is richer today than the richest Crassuses, build the Church of St. Peter out of his own money, instead of out of the poor believers. If Luther ever thought he might get special favors out of Rome, he was going about it the wrong way. He just didn't see things the way the Pope did, and once commented that if the Pope knew what indulgences were doing to the people, he would rather see the Church of St. Peter in ashes. Luther was doing just the opposite of what the Pope was doing. As Henry Thomas observed, and so, because the Pope wanted to rebuild the Catholic Church of St. Peter, he unintentionally laid the foundation stone for the building of the Protestant Church. The Awakening of Humanity, page 6 The seeds of revolt and religious freedom had been planted by many men before Luther, among the foremost was John Huss who lived 100 years before Luther. The ground was fertile now for a reformation, and Luther was the grand tiller even though he didn't want to be, or even suspect that he would be. Luther had to go to trial in Augsburg in October of 1518 to renounce his publications. He wouldn't denounce them so the Pope issued a papal bull in June of 1520 to have all of Luther's works burned. Luther in turn demanded that all of the Pope's works be burned. Germany was ablaze with religious fires. Then the Pope issued an order for Luther to burn in hell. Luther sent his best wishes for the Pope to go to the devil neither volunteered to go. So, in desperation the Pope said he would burn Luther at the stake, just like he did all the others who disagreed with him. It is high treason against the Church to allow so horrible a heretic to live one hour longer. Let the scaffold be instantly erected for him. D. Aubine's History of the Reformation, Book 3, Chapter 9 But Luther wouldn't fight fire with fire, instead he used the scriptures. They didn't have any defense for that, and they flew like quail from birdshot. Luther was called to go before a tribunal in Rome to answer the charges against him. But one of the charges was to banish, curse, and excommunicate all those who are attached to him. Luther didn't think this sounded like an appeal from Christ. He refused to go, 
as he knew of too many that had never returned. It was decided that a formal hearing would be held in Augsburg for Luther to answer the charges against him. At least it was on his home ground and among his friends. When Luther presented his case, the response was retract, retract. It was not the most intelligent argument Luther had ever heard. He then asked for a chance to submit a written statement. In so doing, said he, writing to a friend, the oppressed find double gain, first, what is written may be submitted to the judgment of others, and second, one has a better chance of, working on the fears, if not on the conscience, of an arrogant and babbling despot, who would otherwise overpower by his imperious language. Life and Times of Luther, by Martin, page 27. Luther prepared a statement, and after reading it, handed it to Cardinal Cajetan. His response to Luther was retract, or return no more, so Luther left. After this trial, Luther began to see more clearly the unchristian doctrines and works of Romanism. He then wrote his famous work, called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church. This would sever all relationships with the Pope, if there were any left. In 1519 the Pope loaded his gun with another volley against Luther, John Eck, the famous lecturer, scriptorian, and defender of the Catholic faith. He was a master at debate, but all that came of it was that Luther would not be moved unless he could be proved wrong by the scriptures. That was impossible, so the meeting adjourned. In 1521, the Pope issued orders for the excommunication of Luther. He was required to retract his statements and writings within sixty days or he would receive the spiritual acts of the Church. The Pope demanded the Emperor of Germany to administer the ordinance. Instead, the Emperor, who admired Luther, called for the Diet of Worms. The Diet was a council and Worms was a city. The Emperor wanted Luther to have free speech and all he wanted to defend his case. Charles V was the new emperor from whom the Pope demanded Luther's head, but the people wanted what was in it instead. Prince Charles was caught in the middle of the fight, and yet he wanted to settle the issue. Nothing had been proven against him, he told the Pope, so he suggested that Luther have a fair trial, and he himself would see that he had safe conduct to and from the trial. He also asked Luther if he would cooperate. Luther replied, You may expect everything from me except flight and recantation. Fly, I cannot, and still less retract. Diabine's History of the Reformation, Book 7, Chapter 50 Luther's enemies insisted that there are enough errors in Luther's works to burn a hundred thousand heretics, and they wanted him to retract them. Luther replied, They're busy at worms about compelling me to retract, and this shall be my retraction, I said formerly that the Pope was Christ's vicar, servant, now I assert that he is our Lord's adversary, and the devil's apostle. Ibid, Book 7, Chapter 6 And things continued to get worse for the Pope. He ordered Luther to be silenced, but Luther was scheduled to go before the greatest body of civil and religious leaders in Europe. The Pope demanded that Luther be cut off from all influence, but this trial was gaining international fame for Luther. The Pope had instituted one of the cleverest money-making schemes ever devised to gain money and power, but now he was losing both. Luther was on his way to Worms for a trial that could cost him his friends, his salvation, and his life. It was no easy task for Luther. On the way to this tribunal, he was met by General Franzberg, the outstanding soldier of Germany, who patted him on the shoulder and said, My poor monk. My little monk. Thou art on thy way to make a stand such as I and many of my knights have never done in our toughest battles. Luther probably wondered if that was encouraging or discouraging. I am like Jeremiah, a man of strife and contention, but, the more their threats increase, the more my joy is multiplied. They have already destroyed my honor and my reputation. One single thing remains, it is my wretched body, let them take it, they will thus shorten my life by a few hours but as for my soul, they cannot take that. He who desires to proclaim the word of Christ to the world, must expect death at every moment. Ibid, Book 4, Chapter 4 The argument that followed was mainly retract from the Romanists and prove me wrong from the scriptures from Luther. Both sides displayed stubbornness as one of their principal virtues. Neither would give in. 
In some quarters Rome had issued statements such as, he who should kill that rebellious monk, would be without sin. Luther said he wondered if the Pope was Antichrist. While they were burning his books, he was burning theirs. The final hour had come when the two forces were to meet. A grand assembly of dignitaries of the church and state were to meet at Worms, Germany, to conduct the trial. It was one of the most impressive and illustrious groups of men that had ever assembled. The emperor sat upon the throne while the Church of Rome presented its august body or prelates in colorful robes, and around them stood dignitaries from every level of civil and religious organizations. Luther was conducted before the emperor, and an imperial officer arose and pointed to Luther's writings and asked Luther to answer two questions, were they his writings and would he retract his opinions in them? Luther admitted that they were his writings, but as to the next question, he wanted to postpone answering it. The meeting was postponed for a day, which was to Luther's advantage so he could prepare a proper answer after thoughtful consideration on all points in question. The next day Luther presented his answer in three parts. 1. Some of his works contained admonitions to faith, good works, and Christian beliefs. Those he could not retract, neither should anyone else. 2. Some contained scriptures, and so these he could not condemn or retract, for even Rome confessed and believed them. 3. Some of the rest of his writings were statements against the corruptions of the priests, of Rome and individuals. To sanction such evil would only encourage them to further their wickedness and cruelties. As the trial proceeded, Luther decided to defend himself as Christ did by demanding that if I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. However, his opponents only wanted him to recant, retract, recall the things he said. They wanted a short simple answer, would he or would he not revoke his writings? His answer. Since your most serene majesty and your high mightinesses require from me a clear, simple, and precise answer, I will give you one, and it is this, I cannot submit my faith either to the Pope or to the councils, because it is clear as the day that they have frequently erred and contradicted each other. Unless therefore I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, and unless they thus render my conscience bound by the Word of God, I cannot and I will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand, I can do no other, may God help me. Amen. The Great Controversy, Ellen White, page 160. The whole audience was speechless. Here was Christianity at its finest, and Romanism at its worst. It was evident to everyone that Luther was right. The German princes looked upon this native son with pride and as if they would protect him as their own sons from the fires of Rome. The Pope would have to look for some other victims. The Roman rascals realized that their nefarious cause was exposed under a clear new light. The council decided to withdraw until they could consult further on the issue. A short time later it was rumored that Luther would be kidnapped and hauled to Rome to face the pontiff, an awful, but common, fate of all who resisted their powerful priesthood. Seldom anyone ever returned. But a strange thing happened. Luther disappeared. Had he been murdered? Was he kidnapped by the Pope's henchmen? Did he commit suicide to avoid the pitfall, which seemed inevitable? History now knows that he was kidnapped by his friends. They sent him to the Wartburg Castle, where his name was changed, and he was kept under wraps from the rest of the world. But his banishment was not a punishment, it was a blessing. These circumstances proved to be ideal for him to translate the New Testament from Greek to German. It was his desire that everyone in Germany would have the opportunity to read and interpret the scriptures for themselves rather than depending on the Pope, who didn't seem interested in them anyway. Then, a month after the disappearance of Luther, the French made war on the Germans, and for the next ten years the Catholics and others had more to think about than getting rid of Martin Luther. In establishing Protestantism, Luther made every man a priest. He designed absolute freedom in matters of worship. He confirmed the absolute authority of the scriptures rather than the Pope. He concluded that works, long pilgrimages, fondling beads and prayers, bowing to statues, owning artifacts, buying indulgences, etc., were not important to salvation. In his stand on these doctrines, 
he only meant to correct errors that had crept into the church, he was not trying to start a new church. He was not even trying to start the Reformation. Yet he led one of the greatest movements in religion that ever occurred. Thus, one little monk who dared to think and act for himself in religious matters, changed the thinking of the world. Luther died on February 18, 1546, in Eilben, the very town of his birth. He was then buried in the castle church nearby, where he had posted his 95 theses on the door so many years before. Luther left his footprints in the sands of time. His life and teachings were to be followed by religionists, historians, and biographers for centuries to come. He drew from the scriptures the most positive answers for daily problems. His example and his words became inspiration to every noble soul who has made a quest in the realm of religion. Karl Marx, prophet of the proletariat and father of communism. Born on May 5, 1818, in Treves, Germany, Karl Marx came through a long line of Jewish rabbis. But when he was six years of age, his father was converted to Protestantism and convinced the whole family to also be baptized, even though no one ever understood what made him change his faith. However, a religious train of thought was never in doubt upon Karl anyway. When Karl was 17, he entered the university where he studied philosophy, literature, and law. He did well with his studies, and in 1841 at age 23, he wrote a thesis on the materialistic philosophy of Democritus and Epicurus. He continued with his studies until he was able to obtain his degree as a doctor of philosophy. Apparently, he did not spend all his time with studies, because while he was in school he found Jenny von Westphalen, with whom he fell in love and soon married. As qualified as Marx was as a teacher, he was more fascinated with a revolutionary movement, in support of which he and others wrote a series of revolutionary articles. They were so radical in content that the government suppressed them. Such a trend of thought was also dangerous, so Karl had to leave Germany and go to Paris. Here he continued a series of anti-religious, anti-capitalistic articles. His radical ideas already included such sordid thoughts as religion is the opium of the people, and the people cannot be really happy until they have been deprived of illusionary happiness by the abolition of religion. Marx thought that philosophers only interpreted the world, but he was going to change it. And he did. The trouble was that most people didn't like the way he was trying to change it. In Germany, he had been charged with treason. France didn't think his ideas were very inspirational so they, too, gave him orders to vacate. From there he went to Brussels where his ideas aroused the wrath of the government there as well, probably because he had intentions of starting a materialistic revolution in the government. By now, he and his family were penniless and they left for London. By the age of 31, Karl had gained the title of the prophet of the proletariat, working class. By nature, he was endowed with the characteristics that befit a revolutionary. He was proud, contemptuous, harsh in his opinions, and crude and cruel in his manners. He was intolerant of faults in others, yet in his own character, he was arrogant and conceited. Karl Marx, soon to be called the father of communism, was instilled with a very dedicated spirit of worship, according to an expert on his life. In a book by Rev. Richard Wormbrand called Marx and Satan, Karl was a dedicated worshipper of Satan and had an intense hatred of mankind, whom he called human trash. The book, filled with little-known facts about his life, tells of Karl's youth when he was a dedicated Christian, but suddenly turned to the worship of Satan. He once wrote, I wish to avenge myself against the one who rules above, and then claimed that he would someday become equal with God. In a poem, The Player, Marx explains how he bought a sword from the Prince of Darkness, which upon death he must pay for it with his soul. In his poem, Human Pride, Marx reveals a promise that he will see the collapse of civilization. Karl Marx identified Satan as the co-creator of communism, and that a demon was his personal angel friend. It was this demon friend who was the responsible author of the communist revolution. In London, England, Karl Marx lived in two small rooms with his family of six. He never knew where his next meal was coming from, but they were usually begged from some of his friends. What a paradox in a man who was the hero and prophet of the working man, yet he never was one of them. 
he proclaimed all the virtues of the working class, yet he never could bring himself to join them. His life was a continual story of poverty and hunger. In 1852, one of his children died. The rest of his family were not far from it. If it had not been for Frederick Engels, who continually supported them, they probably would have died, too. Engels was a bookkeeper for his father's factory, and for many years he took over his extra earnings for the Marx family. Continuously Engels poured money into Marx's literary work, called Das Kapital. This was Marx's only major work, for he never completed any others. In 1881, he was dying from an attack of pleurisy, headaches, virulent abscesses, and carbuncles. Karl Marx died in 1883, but he left a most impressive influence on the world from his dialectical materialism. As a man who worshipped the devil, he put forth a most impressive and diligent effort in promoting Satan's work upon the earth. The world has suffered greatly in trying to get rid of it. Nikolai Lenin, patron saint of the proletariat. Vladimir Yulianov was born in 1870 in Simbursk, Russia. Because of his revolutionist and reactionary ideas, he later had to go by the name of Lenin. As the leader of a clan known as Bolsheviks, he overthrew the government of Russia and was so successful at it that he wanted to overthrow all governments. Worshipped by some, hated by others, yet today nearly everyone everywhere suffers because of his influence on the world. He promoted a political disease that said one thing but practiced another. His slogans consisted of statements such as the People's Party, the People's Land, and the People's Government. All of which were foreign to the people. If any government in the world is out of the hands of the people, it is that government under communist rule. In the communist dictionary, the word freedom means slavery, and equality means exploitation. The communists preached communal property, but under communism, the only ones who practiced it were the multitudes who were thrown in prison. Nikolai Lenin came to power through the bloodshed of the Tsar, Nicholas, in 1917. He proposed a new government for the workers, which was really a socialist dictatorship under a new name. They preached brotherhood, but forced upon their brothers extreme torture, prison, starvation, and death. They preached peace, but continuously instigated and promoted war. Henry Thomas wrote. Throughout his life, he had but a single purpose, to bring about a social organization in which there would be no cruelty, no exploitation, no unemployment, no internal intrigues, and no war. To this one purpose, he sacrificed every personal ambition. The Beginning of Real Civilization, page 59. Lenin was so determined in achieving this goal that he ironically used the means of cruelty, exploitation, strikes, international intrigue and war in trying to accomplish it. He placed more people in prison than some nations have citizens. He caused more people to die than in a multitude of wars. Perhaps it was the kind of people that communism attracted to it, but Lenin himself wrote of his own comrades, for every honest man, 39 scoundrels and 60 fools. That ratio hasn't changed much since then. But, even in his own country his ideas were not welcome. He was sent to Siberia, and then managed to leave Russia and flee to the European countries in 1900. In 1905, he returned to Russia and took an active part in the revolution, but was caught and again exiled in 1907. For the next ten years, Lenin was forbidden to enter Russia. However, in 1914, he created a revolution to overthrow and kill the Tsar. He sought to liberate the worker through communism, but that was like saying, I'll promise to give you freedom if you'll be my slave. Tolstoy called his communism cannon fodder. Walter Durant wrote of him. I have seen Lenin speak to his followers, a small, busy, thick-set man, under blinding lights, greeted by applause like thunder. I turned around, and their faces were shining, like men who look on God. New York Times, January 18, 1931. It has also been said that Lenin has become the patron saint of the proletariat. But, few men since the pharaohs have had their bodies pickled for their subjects to view and venerate like they were gods. Nikolai Lenin was an atheist who became a god 